from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello. Welcome. My name is Kate Julian, and I'm the deputy editor of the Sunday Outlook section at the Washington Post. The Post is a very proud charter sponsor of this festival again this year. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind you that the Pavilion's presentations are being filmed for the Library of Congress's website and for their archives. Please be mindful of this as you enjoy the presentation. In addition, please do not sit on the camera risers that are located in the back of the Pavilion. Thanks. It's my great pleasure to be introducing National Book Award winner M.T. Anderson today. M.T. Anderson was born and grew up in Stowe, Massachusetts, but he spent a couple of years as a young child in Italy, where he was fascinated by the Roman ruins he saw dotting the landscape. When he returned to kindergarten in the United States, his teacher was confused by his style of playing with blocks, which involved stacking blocks in big, jumbled piles. As he patiently explained to her, he was building ruins. <laughs> he says that's what he's been doing ever since. If Anderson's writings are ruins, they are magnificent ones. He has published everything from picture books to children's novels to books for young adults. His short, his, excuse me, his short stories for adults have been published in such literary journals as Northwest Review, the Colorado Review, and Conjunctions. He also moves seemingly effortlessly from genre to genre, from vampire novels to biographies of classical composers, from science fiction to satire. Whatever he is writing, he combines a focus on big ideas with a sharp ear for dialogue and a wicked sense of humor. As he has said, I love being an author. There is nothing like realizing that all one has to do for the rest of the day is sit around making up jokes that will entertain me and a 10-year-old. <laughs> His satirical 2002 young adult novel, Feed, imagines, not so improbably, a future in which many people have a device called a feed implanted in their brains, thereby enabling a kind of wireless instant messaging. Feed was a finalist for the National Book Award, and the New York Times Book Review heralded it as proof that young adult novels are alive and well and able to deliver a jolt. And then there is Octavius Nothing, the first volume of which won the National Book Award. A profile of Anderson in the Washington Post two years ago described Octavius Nothing as quote, an ultra-challenging two-volume young adult novel that runs 900 plus pages and asks teen readers to contemplate the American Revolution from a wildly unfamiliar point of view. I should add that it's written in 18th century English. Anderson's books expect a lot of their readers, there is no doubt. But, as he remarked in the same post profile, quote, it's insulting to believe that teens should have a different kind of book than an adult should. His most recent book, The Suburb Beyond the Stars, is a sequel to 2004's The Game of Sunken Stars. Please join me in welcoming M.T. Anderson. Thank you. It's great to see you all here. It's wonderful, especially given this heat. You know, I come from the uh, wilds of uh, Vermont at this point, and uh, you know, up there it's sort of 45 degrees. To come down here and have a few extra days of summer is both a uh, a blessing and a curse. Um, with this jacket on, mainly a curse. But um, anyway, so thank you for coming out. Uh, today, what I'm going to talk about is um, writing and travel and leaving home and returning home, and specifically the suburbs and the suburbs beyond the stars. Um, and I should begin to say by saying that I, uh, I grew up, as you heard, in a small town in Massachusetts, and it was a very standard town. You know, we had our little, uh, our little, you know, uh, brick library with a turret. You know, sort of. The, from the Carnegie era, we had our little, uh, you know, white churches with the steeples. We had our haunted house and our, you know, <laughs> our uh, our apple orchards. You know, our our bad girl. Um, we all these things, you know, sort of the standard American town, and um, it was notable only for being intensely normal and dull and American, which was in fact how I liked it, we, and we were all proud of that. And even the even the bullies in my town. Were, uh, were perfect American bullies. Like, they stuck with the classics, you know what I mean? Like the, the swishy, the swirly, the monkey bite, you know, all the things that really, you know, um, that have continued through the generations uh, to torment nerds like me. So, um, you know, I, be perhaps because my town was, in fact, so resolutely American, I very early took an interest in the idea of travel. And when I went to that little red brick library, I read a lot of books 
that were about travel to the most exotic places possible. So I loved all those books like um, where you, uh, those old books of, of adventure from the turn of the century where sort of English people wearing, in fact, even far heavier jackets than the one I'm wearing now, traipse through the desert or go up the Himalayas and then are standing there next to this sort of treasure trove of you know, uh, ancient Tibetan artifacts that they've just wrested out of the hands of the monks or whatever it is that they're going to take back to England to put in a museum. I loved all of those uh, insane books where they're sort of heading off into the wild. And, uh, and of course, also those books of travel that are entirely fantastical, like Conan the Barbarian. I don't know if anyone actually still reads Conan the Barbarian, but I mean, we, he, uh, you know, he travels around the, uh, the early uh, Earth as it is depicted, despite the fact that Conan the Barbarian's author lived in Texas and claimed that the whole thing was supposed to be somehow a, a portrait of Texas that just happened to include, you know, uh, yeah, giant brawny barbarians, giant snake gods, demons, you know. Although, actually, maybe that's, I'm not, I haven't been to Texas, so uh, <laughs> maybe some of you are from there, I don't know. Um, so, so what thrilled me in all of these books are not just the specific moments of adventure, you know, the fumbling mummies, the lassoed pterodactyls, but also the sense of the vast, untamed landscape. In my little safe suburban house, I dreamed of a world of howling wilderness and secret valleys. I hoped that there were still places to discover, places like that to discover on the earth. And I hoped even more that there were still places that would remain undiscovered and unplundered until the end of time. And part of the pleasure of these books was not just the plot, but the mood of place, the sense of this expansive landscape of adventure. That's what I love, the romance of geography itself. So I always assumed that when I grew older, I would be traveling around the world and writing books of exotic adventure. As it turned out, however, there were two little problems with that. So problem number one is that it appears that people in other uh, countries speak different languages. Um, <laughs> It's very irritating for those of us who speak English. And we are trying to rectify it in all kinds of ways, but, um, but we still haven't ironed it out. And uh, I'm horrible at languages myself, so when I travel, it's a real problem. I mean, I, I can speak a very basic uh, German, in, so in a pinch, if I need to you know, order a, um, like a bombing raid on the Netherlands or something. But basically, I, um, you know, I'm really bad at languages, and I've been trying for about 20 years to learn French. But unfortunately, um, it's, I don't know, no dice. Pot of dice. Something always goes wrong. One summer, in fact, a, um, a girlfriend of mine and I decided we would both learn French. And uh, she learned all these namby-pamby sentences like, um, you know, which way to the bus station? And uh, how much for a pitcher of milk? And all that kind of thing. Well, I decided I was going to learn French entirely from French Baroque opera. Which, for one thing, means I actually don't know any French at all. But also, it means that the conversation has to reach a certain kind of pitch before I can join in. <laughs> because all the phrases I know are things like, um, I fear his terrible vengeance, <laughs> and um, fatal love, drink this scorpion's venom, and be forever silenced. You know, yeah, sure, I can say that if you need me to. But um, uh, it is your own children whose bodies I hurl before you. <laughs> that I can say. You know, I'm right there if that's where the conversation goes. But um, yeah, it never really works out for me. In fact, uh, you know, we learned French to go to uh, France, and it turned out that um, we bought the tickets. We didn't get them in the mail, though. You know, we ordered them. This is uh, uh, before the internet, and um, we didn't get them in the mail. We finally went to the office, and it turned out that there was an empty office with a guy, like the AT&T guy, like closing off the two uh, phone lines. And uh, the owners of this travel agency had actually fled to the Middle East. Um, with our money and everyone else's. So we didn't go to France, we went to, uh, we, um, went to Canada instead, which is America's <laughs> France, I guess. Um, but anyway, we went to Quebec, and uh, to Quebec City and that kind of thing. And um, we were traveling around on the Gaspé Peninsula, which is a very, very beautiful area up there, um, where in fact most people do not speak English, they do only speak French. Um, and this is a good example of how terrible my French is. So we're up there, wandering through this beautiful, beautiful kind of provincial park up there. And we came to this place where uh, all the grass was crushed down. And clearly, several large deer had been sleeping there overnight. And it was a really kind of an idyllic scene. And we're walking along the path away from there. And this guy comes up and asks me in French, uh, what's up the path? So I think, well, I'm going to try to uh, tell him in French. 
So I, what I wanted to say to him was, over there, there's a spot where some large deer were sleeping. So now, of course, I couldn't remember the word for deer. I remembered only that it was cognate with the Latin word for deer, which is cervus. The word I was actually looking for is cerf. But uh, thinking that it was cognate with this cervus, I figured, well, the word must be cervo. Now, anyone who knows French knows that the word cervo means not deer, but brain. So <laughs> what I said to him in the end was not, over there, there's a spot where some large deer were sleeping, but that is the place where the giant brain sleeps. So he looked at me in incomprehension and disgust. I realized that, damn, I had once again failed to learn French. So I just said to him, it is your own children whose bodies I hurled before you. And I stomped off into the forest. And so he, you know, he wandered on, I'm sure thinking, you know, les Américains sont très stupides. Until he went around the corner and found himself face to face with the giant tentacles and massive single eye of the disembodied brain waked from its slumber. <laughs> um, so that happens to me every time I try to speak a foreign language. Like, why did I have to discover that in Nepali, the word kukradinus means bring me some chicken, the word kukuradinus means bring me some dog meat? <laughs> why do they have to be so close? And this brings me to my second point, the reason why I found it hard to travel as much as I wanted to. I am a drab and fussy eater. Um, I have a lot of food allergies, I'm hypoglycemic, and that means I need to eat a huge amount of protein to actually keep myself running. And that's a huge problem when, um, when I'm, you're traveling. Uh, I mean, it really does not take me much to uh, make me hungry. Um, if I were with the Donner Party, I actually would have suggested we started eating the people before we even set out from Illinois. So one time I was in this, the, this little ex kingdom of Sikkim, which is up in the Himalayas. And I had cleverly chosen to go there when the avian bird flu was raging, which meant that there was actually an interdiction on all chicken, uh, on the serving of all chicken and most other animals there. Now, never mind that you can't actually catch avian bird flu from cooked chicken. And never mind that live chickens were walking right through the middle of restaurants with their little brood of chicks following right behind them in a row proudly, as if heading for table seven to have a family night out, you know? It's the, uh, you know, the 12 top or whatever with the chickens. But anyway, there was no chicken to be had. I was in this town, which was called, perhaps fittingly, Yuxum, which was on the edge of the howling Himalayan wilderness that contains Kanchenjunga, the third tallest mountain in the world. And I went to this restaurant, and the guy said, oh, we have one frozen chicken from before the interdiction. You could have that. Would you like that? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I would like that. I would like that. Because, you know, I'm falling apart without protein. So I, I beg for this chicken. And he says, I'll bring you chicken pieces. And I said, yeah, chicken pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he goes, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait. And finally, he brings it out. And it's not, you know, like chicken pulled off the bone, like in a curry. And it's not chicken pieces like thighs or drumsticks and breasts. What he'd done is he'd taken this precious chicken, the last chicken in Sikkim that could be served, and he diced it, he cubed it precisely. So every morsel was like a little cube of like bone and tendon and, and meat all, and, and, and with um, sort of a few scraps of skin covered with chili powder. I never saw anything else like it there. But you know, who cared? I was desperate. I picked it up and began to gnaw on the bones like this. So I'm gnawing on the bones, trying to tear the, 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 the chicken off. And meanwhile, there are these stray cats on the, on the, the dining room table that are walking towards me, trying to get the chicken. And the, these are mangy stray cats with big bald patches and bumps all over them, and they're slinking along towards me. I'm sitting there trying to keep them away with my elbow <laughs> while eating these things, and then their hair starts to fly all over the place. It's getting caught in the chili powder. I'm eating their hair, pushing them backwards, and then one grabs a piece of chicken. And the thing is that cats can choke on cooked chicken bones. It's very dangerous. And even though they were strays, I couldn't have that. So I'm taking the chicken out of the cat's mouth, then with my same hand, probably shoving it in my mouth and I just thought I, there's no way I'm coming out of this alive without some insane feline disease which is gonna be very hard to explain to my doctor so it was at this moment that I decided there has got to be a better way to do this there has got to be a way to travel the world to experience the thrill of travel someplace where I can still buy chip witches and Captain Crunch so I decided I would write I would focus on novels of adventure, exotic adventure, that I could, uh, which would allow me then to experience these fantastical vistas in the safety of my own living room. 
I would travel in my mind, explore new realms from my office chair. Emily Dickinson says there is no frigate like a book to take us lands away. So I could remain chained to home and hearth and still range widely. I could stay in my own home and still dream of traveling in places like Vermont and Delaware. So that is, in fact, what my recent books have been, um, have been about. Um, and I should say that the, the idea of literary traveling is beautifully summed up by T.S. Eliot. He writes this in his poem, Little Gidding. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And I love that idea of that writing as being the thing that takes you away from what you know so that when you come back to what you know, it's unfamiliar. So in the case of this book that I'm uh, hawking today, which I'm sure is available at a uh, nearby bookseller, um, The Suburb Beyond the Stars, the idea was um, the first book in that series, it's the second book of a series that will contain four books in all. The first one was actually, it's called The Suburb, I'm sorry, the first one is called The Game of Sunken Places. And it was written about kind of magical events that take place in Vermont. Because when I was a kid, that's where we would vacation in Vermont. And vacationing there, reading adventure books while I was there, somehow that amazing Vermont landscape with all those beautiful mountains that looks so mysterious, it looks like you can get lost forever and no one would ever be able to find you. That in my mind became like grafted onto all the adventures I was reading while I was there. So I thought what I can do is I will write a series of adventure books that take place in this sort of transformed magical Vermont. So um, the uh, Game of Sunken Places was the first one of those. The second one, which has just come out, is called The Suburb Beyond the Stars. And it's a continuation, and it's about a kind of a, it's a, you know, a sort of a horror novel set in a, uh, in a suburb. Um, because I grew up in a suburb. I know the suburbs well. And in some ways, I thought to myself, it's not scary to have a, uh, a, you know, a horror novel. I mean, it's light horror, but still, it's horror. It's not scary to have that set in a Victorian house, because that doesn't do the thing that T.S. Eliot is talking about in a way. A Victorian house no longer takes you away from yourself, in a sense, because very few of us live in Victorian houses. For, you know, and uh, we're prepared. When we see a Victorian house in a novel, we think, oh, when, the, when are the chains going to start clinking? You know? When is the headless nun going to come by? You know what I mean? If she doesn't come out, you know, we like yell down the hall for headless nun, you know? Um, incidentally, uh, that, this is entirely irrelevant to my talk, but I was wondering, ghosts that appear at like uh, the exact time when they're murdered, do they have to like readjust for daylight savings time? <laughs> Just a question, you know what I mean? Or are they late for half the year? I don't know. Anyway, so I thought to myself, you know, if I do this, novel set in a, uh, in a suburb, which is the place I know, it will actually feel stranger because the unknown, the mysterious, the supernatural will be taking place in a setting that is very familiar. So it will defamiliarize the familiar, and I think that that will be a more powerful effect. So, um, so uh, this book is in fact set in a suburb very much like the ones that were being built all around me when I was a kid, except I've updated the architecture a little bit to make it, you know, the architecture of the 2000s as opposed to the 1980s. So they're more like Palladian windows, you know, for those of you who are connoisseurs of the, uh, the architecture of the suburb. Um, and in fact, um, the other book that I, uh, that I have come out with recently was called Jasper Dash and the Flame Bits of Delaware, which was a, a transformation of the state of Delaware into something even more exciting than it already is. Um, and uh, so if you look on my website, which is mtanderson.com, you can find actually I have like a, uh, a, an interactive map of the state of Delaware as a fantasy map that will tell you completely untrue uh, facts about the state. <laughs> Though I found, I visited it just the other day, and I have to say, um, Nothing could be weirder than the actual experience of going there. Uh, we'd, I met the governor who had written me a very tart letter about a few inaccuracies in my book. <laughs> so um, he, uh, he, it's the only time a uh, state governor has actually called me Buster. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so he wrote me, that letter is actually reproduced in the back of the paperback version of this book, Jasper Dash and the Flame Bits of Delaware. So I went to meet him. He was tremendously nice. He was, nice. He was a very good sport. And I'm driving back from Dover, which many call the capital of Delaware. And, um, on Route 1, um, and uh, we're driving back late at night, and um, we see a helicopter going over with a big, you know, searchlight and stuff, and we said, oh, someone must have escaped from somewhere. <laughs> well, just today when I was at the Delaware table over there in the, uh, the different states, booths, they told me that what was going on was a sniper was actually firing on the cars on the highway that I was driving on. 
and that they were trying to find the sniper. So um, there was my Delaware experience. So actually, it was far more frightening than the Delaware I had imagined. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's so, you know, that's unusual. But um, so, yeah, anyway, these, um, these books are all my attempt to, in a way, reimagine the American landscape um, in, uh, in a fantastical way, in the way that as kids so many of us do. Um, we, you know, so many of us see the little stream that runs through the backyard of our house as a mighty river or the hill nearby us as a mountain and make up a kind of a mythology of the imagination about the place we live. I wanted to make up that kind of mythology. So, um, you know, when I think of the fantasy books I loved, Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan the Bar Barbarian, um, he based Conan's homeland, Samaria, on his realm of Celtic twilight on Fredericksburg, Texas. Little did he know that the actor slated to play Conan, the king of Aquilonia, would instead end up playing governor of California. <laughs> um, in H.P. Lovecraft's Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, a man journeys through a landscape of nightmare in search of a city of dreams, only to discover that what he really seeks is an image of Beacon Hill, Boston, from his childhood, glimmering in the sunset. Ray Bradbury's Martin Martian Chronicles may be set in the deserts and the canals and broken uh, cities of the Red Planet, but what the tales record in many ways is the story of American settlement. In a similar way, I wonder whether we Americans embraced the, langu the, the, the landscape of fantasy so that we could once again be pioneers. We can once again be faced with vast wilderness, this time purged of the guilt for its plunder. We drive through our own landscapes and see towns merge sloppily with other towns, no seam, no distinction, no woodland at the edge of the village in which an ogre might lurk. And we pass the same rotation of Home Depot, Walmart, TGI Fridays, and Ruby Tuesdays, and we long for a map where one town is made of brass and another of fluted pillars. In that land, the forests are huge again, the mountains are full of mystery, we may continue to expand, and these kingdoms will never be exhausted of their riches. Our rapacity need never be satisfied. Though we've sloshed already from shore to shi shining shore, we seek now this soothing manifest destiny of dreams, and we light out for new territories unexplored. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we have time for questions if anyone has them, or we can all just sit here really awkwardly for about 10 minutes. Oh, and there are, there are microphones. Yeah, so this gentleman here, driven to read. Yes. Um, I was wondering, I mean, although you didn't talk about it, I was wondering what inspired you for Whales on Stilts. Okay, so he's asking about my book, Whales on Stilts, and what inspired me. And that was a book, um, for one thing, was because I'd been writing a historical novel set in the Revolution, which was very dark and very hard to do for me, and it was involved a huge amount of research. So I wanted to go on a kind of a mental vacation. And Whales on Stilts was me just saying, I want to have a book that's purely joyful and fun, and the reader who reads it will feel like they're on summer vacation mentally. And so, that's, and so that really was kind of the basic idea. I knew the characters I wanted to have, and I just had to think of a kind of a struggle for them. And around that time, a very tragic thing happened, which is a bunch of whales um, somehow swam onto the beach in Cape Cod, somewhat near where I live. And um, w though that was tragic, I started to think, you know, um, what would an invasion of whales who want to take back the land be like? I mean, whales actually did walk for a while. Um, they got tired of it. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, so that book is actually about this invasion of whales who, uh, you know, storm onto the land with laser beam eyes to take it back. There you go. Thank you for reading it. Thank you for telling me why. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Keep, keeping with your uh, points on foreign language, it feels like a lot of your uh, characters, say, in Feed or Octavian mm -hmm. Nothing, uh, speak in a language that could be foreign to the unassuming reader. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that you really immerse yourself in that sort of language in order to get the word choice right and everything. Could you talk about that? Yeah, bit? sure. I do a lot of like immersion because I feel like the language that we speak in actually in some ways creates the world that we live in. You know, it creates the way that we understand it and in many ways it, you know, it convinces us of what, you know, uh, what matters and what doesn't matter, that kind of thing. So I do do a huge amount of research um, about the language before I write a book. So for those Octavian Nothing books set in the 18th century, for six years while I did the research for that and wrote them, I basically read only books 
from that period or about that period or books they would have read in that period, like Latin and Greek books, that kind of thing. And that's uh, because I wanted to get that language right. For Feed, which is a, um, uh, uh, a book set in a kind of an idiotic future in which everyone is a, uh, is a moron, and as a result of having this little chip in their head that kind of constantly broadcast the internet to them, which means they constantly are receiving, you know, um, advertisements for everything that they see and that kind of thing. That, um, I read a lot of slick m magazines like, um, like uh, you know, uh, S 17 and, you know, um, uh, uh, G GQ, all that kind of thing, Vogue. So I had that kind of insane, you know, like, hey guys, sort of voice in my head when I wrote that. Um, and then one time uh, I got a message on, a, on, an e on some kind of a blog or something. Some, someone wrote, he always uses the word like in his writing and no one says like anymore. No teenager says like anymore. It's like he um, was a teenager, you know, back in like the 80s or something. And I was like, oh, you are right. <laughs> so I decided to find out. So I went down to the main kind of student strip in Boston and I just kind of walked randomly down the street to see, just sort of not listening to conversations so much as just hearing the words that were used. And um, the, uh, surprisingly, the police didn't pick me up. And um, I discovered, after having wandered up and down the street a few times ambling, that overwhelmingly people said like. They said it so much that, in fact, I felt worried about using the word like in the normal context by the end of the evening. So, um, so yeah, uh, that, uh, that kind of research is stuff that I have done. Yeah. Uh, back on this side, sir. What gave you the idea for Jasper Dash? So uh, th this is a question about Jasper Dash, who's a character from my Pals and Peril series that in includes both Whales on Stilts and that book Jasper Dash and the Flame Pits of Delaware. And he is a, um, he's a kid who is uh, from a kind of early adventure book, like uh, Tom Swift or something, and he believes in sort of exciting inventions, and, uh, and he's going to sort of, you know, uh, make the world safe for democracy and that kind of thing. The problem is that his inventions are all like the inventions from an old adventure book. So he's like, I have invented a phone for which you need no wires. And um, you can carry it, it's small enough, you can carry it around with you on this cart. And um, you know, the problem with that is that of course the world has really moved past the future of the past. And I, I just loved those books when I was a kid. I loved the idea of reading children's adventure books which people hadn't read for years and feeling like, wow, like my dad might have read this. So. Um, that was kind of the idea for that, is reading those old books and wanting to revive that character and think, what would it be like for him to be in the modern world? But thank you for reading and for asking the question. Yeah. Yes? I love writing science fiction books. Great. And my you love writing them. Well, I mean, like in class for in Yeah, class. great. Uh -huh. And my English teachers, they always tell me that you can't write anything that you don't know or don't experience. Like, I told them, what about Lord of the Rings? We don't have Lord of the Rings. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, would you have any yeah. comments on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if J.R.R. Tolkien had hairy feet or not, but no, I mean, I think, um, <laughs> you know, no, I think, uh, well, here's how I would put it. You might be writing about something that you know, but in a very, very unfamiliar alien context. So, for example, a lot of people have argued that The Lord of the Rings is in some ways about, um, you know, the, wor the, the World War, the World War I, for example, and the, the sense of loss during that. And so wh when you are thinking about science fiction, the things that move you, might in fact be very familiar to you, even if they're happening on worlds far away. It's the internal truth, not the external truth, that in a sense you have to really know. And I think that's about the time we have. So thank you all very much. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.